As I offer some thoughts on Unitarian and Unitarian Universalism around the world, I want to commence with two premises. The first is very old and unoriginal. Religion comes from the Latin verb meaning to bind up. So it's that set of beliefs, stories, and assumptions that we use to tie our world together, to make sense of it, to put certain basic things in place so that we can get on with our lives. Now, it's a definition that has long been popular in divinity schools, particularly UU seminaries, for it allows us to see religion as something we co-create instead of something we divinely receive. We UUs prefer to have a hand in stuff rather than be handed stuff. Now, the second premise is one from a continuing education course I led last fall through the University of Alberta. Religions are part and parcel of the local culture in which they exist. Whether they are founded in a particular place or transplanted from another nation, they inevitably take on the flavor of the land in which they live. So to sum up those two thoughts, religions are one way that we make sense of the world in which we live and we adapt religion to reflect the culture in which it exists. Now, some people assume and assert that religions are consistent and constant and unchanging, but it's just not true. So what's that got to do with Unitarianism and Universalism on a global scale? Well, everything, really. I was involved in the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists for 11 years, eight of them as president. And through biennial council meetings held in nine different countries on three different continents and other gatherings, I had the privilege of meeting, worshiping, and socializing with our co-religionists from over 40 countries. Now, one of the features of those gatherings was that brief daily services were conducted by people from diverse nations, showing how they did worship and sharing some messages central to their understanding of Unitarianism. And it was really eye-opening for me. Now, I became a Unitarian in Canada about 40 years ago. And in that time and in my career, I visited well over half of our congregations. Now, there is a fair degree of consistency that makes up our CUC. We are generally socially liberal, often politically liberal as well. Humanism is the dominant theological mode. Even those among us who identify as Christian or Jewish or pagan or Buddhist still find a humanist approach comfortable. To boil that down, we tend to think that God, if such an entity exists, expects us, expects us to work out this life for ourselves. We generally don't like being told what we have to think or what we have to do. And while we love our sense of community, we tend to defer to leadership, knowing that if we stand up, we will be asked to take over the project or serve on the committee or lead the dinner or whatever. And we all have busy lives. So sometimes we get a little passive about that. Now, our worship format, whether we like it or not, typically grows out of the Protestant form with readings, hymns, sermons, and perhaps a few light rituals. We are more interested in contemporary ideas generally and contemporary issues than ancient scriptural teachings. A lot of us like singing, but not all of us. We like to be challenged by the ideas expressed in the service, but we also like to feel affirmed and supported. We don't like to be made to feel guilty. And most of us do love coffee hour. We like to be inclusive, but to be the honest truth is that to be included, a newcomer kind of needs to feel at home with our congregational culture. There is an expectation that they will learn how to fit with us rather than us adjust ourselves to fit with them. Some people think this is a failing. I'm not sure I do. I think it's just cultural tradition. As I said at the outset, religion is formed within a cultural context. Each of our congregations worldwide has its own microcosmic system. And I didn't really see that until I began my international journeys. I'd always thought that 
our way, our Canadian way, was pretty much the norm. It was the definition of Unitarianism. I was very wrong. Fifteen years ago, I had the opportunity to visit and teach at Unitarian communities in Africa and then in the Philippines. Now, the African communities were brand spanking new to Unitarianism for the most part, and the Filipinos had been around for about six decades. Now, my preconceptions of what Unitarianism is, liberal, post-Christian, kind of stayed, and of course, therefore, that's how it's supposed to be, were dissolved by these cross-cultural experiences. In Kenya, that Leadership Training Week brought Unitarians from, I think it was eight different African nations. Our Kenyan hosts led the opening worship. Well, it began with 20 minutes of happy, free-form, dancing processional. Everybody danced their way into the worship hall, and there were hugs and handshakes and smiles. 20 minutes of this. Not exactly a three-minute piano prelude by Vivaldi. As a and the service and the sermon, unlike most North American counterparts, was solidly, solidly biblically based. Jesus was the central figure and God was the source of all blessings. In other words, on the face of it, it was a far more Christian service than I was used to seeing, or certainly leading. And it made me uh, more than a bit uncomfortable at first. But as I listened, I realized that the message, in spite of all of its God language, was actually kind of humanist and kind of self-actualizing and very much in keeping with the liberal Unitarian tradition with which I was just familiar. It was a little bit like going to um, uh, uh, an, an Indian restaurant for the first time and having curry for the first time in your life. It's still food. It's still whatever kinds of foods you're used to eating. It's just wrapped up so completely differently. God in was the indeed the great provider of life and blessing, but he wasn't judgmental. Jesus was a great teacher, but he wasn't the redeemer. Such salvation was, as was available to us in this life is of our own making and in our own hands. I confess to my own prejudice that when the message began with traditional religious language, I kind of felt my hackles rising. But that was unfounded bias on my part. The message I heard was very familiar but with a different cultural flavor and set of images. And when the sermon was done, then there was more singing and more dancing. And then when the offering was taken, the full plate was handed to one of my co-leaders to give to the poorest family in the church. Talk about direct action. Talk about shocking to a Canadian minister. Give away the offering. Oh, my God. And then a year or two later, I guess preached at a rural village in the Philippines. Sorry, you can't see this picture. It, uh, it was a little cinder block church. It had a gate rather than a door, a, a wrought iron gate rather than a door. There were no windows. It had a tin roof. And the only musical instrument was a battered guitar. I also got to preach at one of the main churches in Dumaguete. And the only difference was it was a larger cinder block building. The floor was beaten earth. There were more children in the room than adults running around. And my sermon, translated live into Kabuian, had to wait until after the meditative rituals were led by the congregation's faith healers. Faith healers? No, it wasn't as absurd as the so-called astral surgery charlatans who supposedly reach into your stomach and pull out whatever is ailing you, which is usually leftover chicken parts. But it was a reflection of a very ancient local religious practice. It involved a beautiful ceremony of the women, senior women, laying hands on those who were physically and spiritually ill. It was powerful. And for them, it was clearly the high point of the service, the truly religious moment when community came together to give aid to the most vulnerable among them. I could see it having a 
positive effect on the stricken. And my sermon, excellent as of course it was, was the sideshow, the entertainment. Community care was the heart of their worship. Another cross-culturally enlightening moment. In each of these communities, Unitarianism was seamlessly adapted to suit the culture. Our liberal faith was a new message, a liberating message, but it had to be delicately laid over the old ways that defined religion for those people. Because religion is what ties their world up and makes sense of it. As many of our Canadian services distantly resemble Protestantism, those in other lands need to respect the old folk ways that have seen people through colonization, wars, natural disasters, poverty. Religion belongs to culture, not the other way around. Now that makes sense because we form our church communities with like-minded people. We want to be comfortable in our congregation, surrounded by familiar symbols and rituals. We need congregations to fit into the communities in which we live. Perhaps you've been to a gospel church or a synagogue or even a mosque and maybe have felt kind of out of place, like you didn't know the rules of the game. To become connected with a new way of religion we need to have a degree of comfort and safety. So religion must reflect for us what we know and what we want. Now, these unfamiliar Unitarian experiences for me forced me to take a hard look at what I realized to become a somewhat doctrinaire view of my own faith. I began to realize that religion is indeed shaped by culture. And when there is an attempt to impose a new religion on an already existing spiritual system, the people will adapt and incorporate the old ways to greater or lesser degrees, no matter how hard church leaders may try to stop that. Now, I'm not going to get into specifics about how our faith arrived in all the diverse lands of Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, or North America. Each journey was released, was unique, and in some cases, the discovery of our ideas came from books that had somewhere, somehow found their way to those foreign lands, as in India or the Philippines, and more recently in Africa, through internet searches on liberal religious ideas. And in a few cases, like North America and Australia, by accidental missionaries who emigrated and brought Unitarianism and Universalism with them. The point is that when liberal religious tradition landed, it changed to fit the ground in which it needed to grow. So what ties Unitarians and Universalists worldwide together, intellectually speaking? The first is a radical acceptance that all religions have validity, not just ours, and that we do not have any exclusive answers. A corollary is that people should have freedom of belief and be allowed to use their own intellect to help define those beliefs. The core historic ideas of Unitarianism, that there's only one God, and Universalism, that all will be saved, go back to the earliest days of Christianity. They were purged from that tradition in the fourth century, but you know, it's really hard to kill an idea. They would resurface in Europe during the Protestant Reformation about 500 years ago, leading to the formation of our first identified Unitarian groupings. Now, they were still Christian, to be sure, but a Christianity that did not require belief in the Trinity and was not bound by dogmatic teachings. It was a religious approach that trusted human intellect and our ability to reason to help us discern truth and define morality. Now, most notably, this freedom of religion argument would take root briefly in Transylvania, as we heard earlier. Uh, Transylvania is an ethnically Hungarian province now in Romania, just shy of 500 years ago. Now, 
I love the story that Kathleen read about the diet of Torta. It's one certainly everybody in my business knows very, very well. Um, it's celebrated. I'll tell you as a side note that the uh, Transylvanians are thrilled that they have in Torta finally gotten the government to release a famous painting of Francis David at the diet of Torta. Um, that the government has suppressed, the mostly Catholic government has suppressed for the last 50 years. So that's a great celebration they had when they were able to hang the painting again in their church in Torda. However, um, the other part that, that isn't told in that story is a larger historical context. Sorry, I'm a history, history nut. At that time, Transylvania was a land stuck in the mountainous Carpathian region between the Christian Holy Roman Empire and the Muslim Ottoman Empire. It must have been a very nervous place to live, a little like Ukraine today, stuck between two superpowers. So for a few decades, the Diet, the Parliament, supported the king, deciding that religious tolerance not only was a good thing, but it might be a hope for peace. Unitarian congregations formed. As royal policy, this freedom unfortunately did not last. The Catholic Counter-Reformation eventually triumphed. But the Unitarian religion has continued and thrives, sometimes unfettered, sometimes in the face of governmental restrictions. And though there are some large, beautiful old urban churches, the core of Transylvanian Unitarianism still lies in small rural villages where you can even see horse-drawn carts along with the, the, the Mercedes and the Toyotas. I found myself in centuries-old country church, which is sort of divided so that there were two sides rather than pews in front of the pulpit, where the men sit on one side, the women sit on the other side, and the youth are all forced to sit right up front where they can be watched by their elders. And the ministers preaches a sermon off the cuff, no notes, uh, but always relying on a scripture passage still, even though it is a sermon that you and I would find very recognizable. And the pulpit is usually eight feet off the ground. So it's, it's the voice from on high. Now, interestingly, most of our ministers live in parsonages surrounded by plum orchards. Often even the urban ministers will also serve a small rural parish. And um, I, I do have a visual aid here. Um, this, is, uh, this is a stitching uh, that is done uh, by women in the communities, uh, the rural communities. It's, uh, they do altar cloths and all kinds of things. But in this case, it's a bag. Now, these ministers live in the parsonages that all have plum orchards. Apparently the Carpathian Mountains is a great place for growing plums. And it's kind of part of their payment that they get the produce from these plum orchards. And a lot is sold for whatever, whatever, whatever. But some of it is held back. The ministers all hold some back to go ahead and distill it into the worst rot gut plum brandy called Palenka. And furthermore, when these ministers go traveling to European conferences, they take Coke bottles full of the stuff and they bring it. And as president, I was forced on every occasion to drink more than one. To I don't drink hard liquor. I'm a beer guy, right? Drink toasts of this jet fuel. And uh, it was the greatest sacrifice I made in my international council years. It is brutal stuff good for lighting fires if you ever get stuck. But yes, they bring it all over in water bottles and Coke bottles across international boundaries. I hope you're never subjected to it. Well, back to the travelogue. The ideas of religious freedom and humanist, by the way, if you're going to have a party, have it with Transylvanian ministers who are away from home. They all have to behave nicely at home. So when they're away, they're an awful lot of fun. The ideas of religious freedom and humanist, and that goes for the women ministers as well. They're a blast. The ideas of religious freedom and humanist thought would next surface in Holland and the United Kingdom around about the late 18th, early 19th century. And the first Unitarian and Universalist meetings would be organized in England early in the 19th century. And from there, it migrated to the US of Canada. Now, the other old 
Unitarian tradition formed in the 19th century was in northeastern India. And if you ever look at the map, it's like a little appendix stuck on. They're not even actually ethnically Indian. Um, where a scholarly educated man discovered the writings of an American minister and began a correspondence and eventually formed a ministry that still goes strong. There are about 6,000 Unitarians in Northeast India. A very similar story happened in the Philippines after World War II. Toribio Kamada, a minister of a more traditional faith, grew disillusioned with Helen Damnation. And he found a pamphlet describing universal salvation. So he wrote to the Universalist Church of America. This was before the, um, uh, before the merger of Unitarians and Universalists. And it led to a long correspondence and the first congregation to be founded in the Philippines on the island of Negros in the city of Dumaguete on one of the smaller islands. It wasn't well received in the primarily Catholic country because Kimada was also a radical social activist working on peasant rights, farmers' rights. He was arrested and tortured and murdered. But his daughter, Rebecca Shianis, carried on and is a fully fellowship minister within our North American church and leads the 30 strong congregations of the Philippine organization. Although I just learned that uh, day before yesterday, she went into hospital with a uh, minor stroke. Um, and I learned this from her daughter-in-law, Elvi Villagracia, who is carrying on as the leader of the tradition. The thing is that Unitarianism expanded because of ideas not missionaries. And people adapted the ideas to suit their cultures. They were longing for religious freedom and in our tradition found a way of expressing it and structuring it. They were open to blessing and salvation, however it was defined and expressed it in ways that spoke to them, calmed them, helped them make sense of their world and bring them peace and comfort, which in the end is pretty much the driving purpose of religion. So one last encounter with diversity. I do wish you could see these pictures, they're great fun. In 2014, I joined the 135th anniversary celebration of Unitarianism in the remote Kazi Hills of Northeastern India. Now, Unitarianism has long been strong there with a social focus that created a situation where Unitarians actually run most of the public schools and health clinics. Now there were easily 2000 people came to this celebration and a lot of them traveled for days, including significant portions of the journey on foot, getting to bus routes or, or cars. Uh, people just housed with people in the, they just opened, the people of, the, of Jawai opened their houses to these folks and they all just came together dressed in some incredible finery. We gathered on a public soccer field that weekend facing a huge striped blue tent stage. It must have been 40 meters wide and it was full of dignitaries and then there was room for choirs and cultural dances and everything else. The celebration went on all day. And that night I found myself marching with a thousand people in a torchlight parade around the city of Jawai, a city with very few street lights. So these uh, bamboo torches uh, cast a great light. Uh, we sang hymns in the Kazi language, which sounded an awful lot like pop tunes, and they were supported by blasting speakers loaded on a pickup truck. And the president of the Northeast Indians told me that these torchlight parades were common practices in the region for all the religions, for all the big holidays, and that the churches loved to parade in front of one another. And they were all very accepting of it because the core of Indian Unitarianism is oneness with God and oneness in God. In my travels and my encounters, I learned that one of the great gifts of Unitarian and Universalism is its flexibility. Free from restrictive teachings or rules that invite us to take liberal religious values common to us all and express them in contextual ways, contextual ways that might not be quite as common among us. Common values, uncommon contexts. There are differences to be sure, 
some of which can be uncomfortable at times. But in the end, we are each striving to make sense of the world, working to learn lessons that life presents us, framing a set of moral principles to guide us, and interpreting those principles in a way that makes sense where we live. We all stand up for personal faith, for social justice, for the rights of people, including those with whom we disagree. The world over, you might say that Unitarian Universalism is a religion, but I think it would be more accurate to say it's a collection of religions that say that you're okay, just the way you are, wherever you are. Thank you.